Hello everyone and welcome back. Welcome to the second video in my series on the history of women's suffrage, otherwise known as the women's vote or women's right to vote. Our first video in the series, if you might recall, was on the suffragettes. Just to recap briefly on that, the suffragists were egalitarians, made up of men and women campaigning for the vote, whereas the suffragettes were true feminists. It's similar to the difference between egalitarianism and feminism today. If you're interested in actual equality, you are by definition an egalitarian, not a feminist. Feminism, both historically and fundamentally, has no interest in both equal rights and responsibilities, even if some women who hold the title uh, would say that it does. I had also intended to point out that the suffragettes were also socialists, and because they were anti-capitalist, split off from the suffragists. They were also extremely racist. They wanted upper-class white women to have the vote before black men, because what would happen to them if black men got the vote first? And as we also discussed, they were textbook dictionary definition domestic terrorists. We discussed their prolonged bombing campaign, primarily across the UK. And of course this makes sense, as their slogan was, in fact, deeds, not words. It's bizarre, of course, to hear high school history teachers and feminists opine about these brave women who risked jail in order to win the vote for future generations of women, as if being willing to suffer for what you believe automatically makes your beliefs right. But today let's discuss the anti-suffragists, a movement led and supported by women who opposed both the suffragettes and the suffragists. They opposed the idea of women being given the vote altogether. If this sparks a curious question mark in your brain, I'm so glad you're here because that's what we're talking about today. It's truly fascinating how much there is to this whole topic of women's suffrage. Of course, the history that we all learn on it in school is extremely brief, but if you love history and research yourself, you'll likely understood some little known facts about it, such as the reality that men voted on behalf of and usually not in opposition to their families that the majority of women were very happy with this arrangement, and that women not voting had nothing to do with them being seen as somehow less than human, but had more to do with not holding them to all of the other responsibilities of citizenship that came with the vote. We'll get into this in a moment. All of that being said, the question we're exploring today is not, should women have been given the vote? I think the greater question here, which brings a greater depth and dimension of understanding, is, was it some sort of patriarchal oppression which excluded women from the vote? Is it true that women as a whole desired the right to vote, and that men as a whole would not allow them? To which history and I both agree that the answer is an unequivocal no. Here's the truth. The vast majority of women were either indifferent or downright hostile to having what they saw as the unwanted obligation and responsibility of the vote foisted upon them. Little known fact, in 1895, the state of Massachusetts polled the women of the state, asking if they desired the right to vote. The result? Less than 4% of women said that yes, they did in fact desire the right to vote. The anti-suffragist movement was birthed and proceeded to campaign against the vote for women. Now, what on earth was going on here? We'll talk about that in a second. But how crazy it is to think that both the suffragettes and the suffragists comprised a minority of women, whereas most women opposed the vote, and yet the way our history books tell it, the anti-suffragists were a tiny group of women who didn't represent women as a whole, that is, if they're mentioned at all. Now, why indeed would women oppose their own legal right to vote? Let's actually explore this rather than doing the easy thing and dismissing it all as internalized misogyny or ingrained patriarchy or using some other buzzword of the sort. There were multiple reasons at play here. Women largely felt that it would threaten the family institution. Men had their sphere, and women had their sphere, and politics was not within women's sphere. Let's look at just a couple of the reasons the anti-suffragists gave, put into eloquent words by an anti-suffragist named Grace Goodwin. Several of the points made in her book called Anti-Suffrage, Ten Good Reasons were published on March 22, 1914, in a column in the New York Tribune. Now let's take a look at two of those reasons. The first, and I quote, Because our present duties fill up the whole measure of our time and ability, and are such as none but ourselves can perform. Our appreciation of their importance requires us to protest against all efforts to infringe upon our rights by imposing upon us those obligations which cannot be separated from suffrage, but which, as we think, cannot be performed by us without the sacrifices of the highest interests of our family and our society." End quote. 
In other words, anti-suffragists, like most all of their contemporaries, saw voting not so much as a right, but as a duty. It wasn't like today, when 18-year-olds who don't do a lick of research can go cast an uninformed vote, sometimes based at best on what they've briefly gathered from the nightly news produced by our propagandist media, or, in plenty of cases, based solely upon the candidate's race, or sex, or how he or she makes them feel. I knew a woman who, not even kidding, said that she voted for Obama solely because she thought he was hot. I knew a man who voted for Obama because he liked the sound of his speeches. And I've heard from several women who voted for Hillary because she was a woman. And it's our responsibility as women to back women no matter what, right? And to make history, or didn't you know that? Yikes! The irony, of course, being that to vote for someone based solely on their sex is the definition of sexism. But previous generations did not view voting as a game, or like picking your favorite contestant on America's Got Talent, but rather as a sacred trust, a responsibility that carried weight for protecting what our founding fathers gave their lives to institute, and shaping the future of our nation, which it, of course, does. They assumed that voting would require a greater participation in politics than merely dropping a ballot in a box every so often. They reasonably assumed that it would mean taking responsibility to keep up with politics, maintaining a vast knowledge about individual candidates and about the ever-changing political landscape. They further assumed that the right to vote would be accompanied by several other duties of citizenship to which men at the time were held. And in a time when running the home, running charities, helping at church, being a legitimate help and resource to one's husbands, while raising, training, and educating the next generation of human beings was rightly seen as a full-time job on its own, most women were baffled as to who in her right mind would desire further weighty demands piled on top of these. This was particularly because they valued the unique job and calling of motherhood and knew that their husbands could never be mothers. But they certainly could keep up with politics on behalf of the family. Of course, this is a hard concept to convey with all of its implications and meaning today when being a wife has been stripped of its qualifications and obligations so that it's hardly seen as a vocation, not to mention that the role of motherhood is now seen as not much more than glorified babysitting. The second of the reasons that Grace Goodwin gave, which I'll share with you, was this, and I quote, Because it is our fathers, our brothers, our husbands, and our sons who represent us at the ballot box. Our fathers and our brothers love us. Our husbands are our choice and one with us. Our sons are what we make them. We are content that they represent us in the cornfield, on the battlefield, and at the ballot box. And we, them, in the schoolroom, at the fireside, and at the cradle, believing our representation, even at the ballot box, to be thus more full and impartial than it would be were the views of the few who which suffrage adopted, contrary to the judgment of the many. End quote. Those are honestly some of the most beautiful words I have ever read in my life. Why do we act as though men voting on behalf of their families was oppressive and sinister? These men had daughters, wives, mothers, sisters. They knew their votes directly affected the lives of the people they most loved. It may be difficult in the midst of what is our current full-blown gender war to imagine a time when both men and women largely cooperated with one another, were not out for blood, did not strive so actively to take one another down, a time when it was socially unacceptable for boys to speak rudely to girls and unthinkable for girls to go around wearing t-shirts with slogans denigrating boys. But this was reality nonetheless. There seems to be this question in the minds of the modern American woman that goes something like, how could women of our past not see how oppressed they were? So I'll just say it. Women have never in American history been an oppressed class. Never. When women were supposedly chained to a role centered around the home, men were also chained to a role that demanded that they provide at all costs. And, especially pre-industrial revolution, but even after, those costs were often very high. While women were supposedly slaves to the kitchen, their supposed oppressors were slaves to the coal mines and early death. While women were forced to care for their own children, Men were forced to go defend those women and those children on the battlefields in wartime, even shamed into it by women, as was the case with the White Feather Campaign during the particularly enormous and horrifically pointless loss of life that was World War I. And while the expectation on a woman to raise her children lasted only until those children were grown, 
The expectation on her husband to provide financially, even if it meant working his fingers to the bone and himself to an early grave, lasted a lifetime. From whence comes this utterly blind, contrived lie that while most women were toiling away in the home in what Betty Friedan called comfortable concentration camps, most men spent their days smoking cigars and sipping cognac in a mahogany library somewhere. Our culture never had vocational expectations of women, which were not balanced, if we must call it that, by often harsher vocational expectations of men. To argue that women specifically were oppressed you would have to admit that it was some sort of mutual oppression going on, which isn't the definition of oppression at all. In other words, you cannot make the case that women were held to a certain gender role without acknowledging that men were held to the counterpart of that role, which means that sexism, if we must call it that, was not applied misogynistically against women, but against everyone. It's called complementarianism, by the way, or males and females functioning according to their biological differences, not sexism. And it is against this historical backdrop that I emphatically state, you could reasonably make the case that women should have had the vote, but you cannot reasonably make the case that women were pining for it and men were withholding it from them. As much as it may grind the gears of androgynous 21st century thinking, the majority of men and women agreed with gender roles and considered them sensible. So, to answer the question, how could women not see their own oppression, we have to ask a better question, I think. Why is it that we insist upon seeing Western women as having been oppressed? To pretend that women not having the vote was unjust and oppressive, and especially to pretend that they felt it oppressive at the time, is to be guilty of presentism. It's the fallacy of nunc pro tunc. It's a Latin phrase meaning then as now putting elements of the present world back into the past in a false way. It's time traveling with our current mindsets and our current world views and transplanting them back into history as if it was the same world then as it is now. It was not merely most men, but nearly all women who felt that the highest calling on earth would be to create and nurture life. The government only existed to make that possible and to support the family. Why would a woman who has the superior office of the home, of having the greatest influence on the next generation of human beings while they're at their most malleable, lower herself to be concerned with matters of politics? Lyman Abbott wrote an article titled Why Women Do Not Wish the Suffrage, articulating this mindset absolutely beautifully. Um, and I'll put that, the link to that article below. Like it or dislike it, this was the thinking of the time. It's a different perspective than the West has now, that's for sure, but it's a valid one. It has taken decades of tireless Marxist and feminist propaganda to change our mindset on this. And of course, the real kicker here, and the irony, is that it's all coming full circle as we begin to see the family as the most important work yet again. With a Forbes poll showing that a colossal 84% of women I said 70 in a different video, I was wrong. It's 84% of women describe the stay-at-home mom life as the American dream. There really is so much to this topic that if I had all the time in the world, I could do an entire series on the anti-suffragists alone. The more I've read books and articles in their own words, as well as study their movement through the eyes of historians, I am astonished both by how much information on them is out there and also by how hardly anyone has been exposed to any of it. The struggle to attain the vote for women, as narrated by high school and college history courses, is not so much only one side of the coin, though it definitely is that, as much as it really is more like tearing the tiny corner off of a painting and thinking that in your hand you possess the entire canvas. So if you'd like to read up on the anti-suffragists more for yourself, um, I will provide links and suggestions for various resources in the description box below. And I will continue to add my findings there as I acquire them. If you're a non-feminist woman in this day and age, feminists will try to make you feel like a radical woman hater who simply has no knowledge of what women have had to endure down through the centuries, right? And no appreciation for what feminism has supposedly given us. But take heart, you and I actually come from a long historical line of women who dared to think objectively, even back in the day. Never forget that for as long as feminism has been around, 
there also have been women who stood up and opposed it. If you enjoyed this video and think that it's a message worth sharing, I'd be obliged if you would like and share. And if you'd like to be notified by YouTube when I post new videos, you can go ahead and click that red subscribe button as well. Thank you as always for taking the time to hear my thoughts and also to share yours. And I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. See you next time.